Well, good morning, Grace Bible Fellowship. How are you? What a chatty group we are, eh? It's all in the name, isn't it? Grace. It's about God's grace, his unmerited favor that we didn't deserve and we certainly can't earn. And it's about the Bible, in which we will be reading today, line by line, to study, to show ourselves approved workmen that don't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And fellowship, which is what we overdose on. <laughs> We're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. We were here last week and we looked at the crucifixion. Going through the book of Mark, went through chapter 15, and we got to see how everything laid out with Jesus, beginning with him carrying his cross and being beaten. He carries his cross, and because of the blood loss that he had, he wasn't able to carry his own cross. Maybe that's why Jesus tells us in the New Testament that we're to carry his cross. And so here comes the Romans making him carry the cross beam and he stumbles and falls and they just grab a passerby, this man Simon of Cyrene, he's actually from Africa, and gets him to carry with Jesus to carry his cross. We looked at that last week and now they went to the place of the skull, the place Golgotha it's called, where they nailed him to the cross and put him up. And if you look at the picture, you can still see vaguely what looks like a skull actually inside of the, the wall. And we talked about the historicity of that and some of the famous skulls that were supposedly there. How Origen and some of these other first century Christians, uh, like uh, they mention about how there's a skull that's buried there and they found it. So we went over that last week. So they take Jesus and they try to give him some anesthetic. They try to give him this gall mingled with wine, not because they wanted to have mercy, but because they wanted to prolong the exhibition. They wanted him to not feel the pain. And so they went to give it to him and he didn't take it because he knew that it was drugged because he was experiencing the full wrath of God for us. And he didn't take a shortcut. He didn't do the easy thing. He did the hardest possible thing, and he did it because that meant our redemption. We got to see the soldiers dividing up, which is what happens when people die typically. All of their possessions get divided up, and you get to see who the vultures are in your family. Jesus had nothing. He just had the clothes that were on his back, and of course, they were full of blood from the beatings and from the whippings, and the soldiers divided up his garments among themselves except for one piece that was all in one and they didn't want to tear it and so they stripped Jesus of all of his clothes so he was hung naked on the cross regardless of all of the paintings you've ever seen uh, they're doing that to make it g-rated Jesus was hung naked and they did that for an ultimate humiliation not just beaten not just pegged to a cross and suffocating but naked before the world so as he was there, we see that he, they hang him up there with two other criminals. It was supposed to be Barabbas on that center cross, but they hung two other thieves on either side and they began to mock Jesus. And one grows a conscience and begins to become sensitive to the fact that Jesus has done nothing wrong. And he begins to tell the other criminal, hey, we're, we deserve what we're getting, but the, he hasn't done anything wrong. He's innocent. And then he goes to him and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Yeah. And he shows simple faith in who Jesus is and the person of Christ and what he's doing. Not having done anything else, just placing faith in Jesus. And he says, today I will see you in paradise. So they're jeering at Jesus and telling him to come down off that cross and say, look, he healed other people. He benefited people. He fed people, but look, he can't even help himself. He can't get down off that cross. Well, of course he can't get down off that cross because if he did, then you and I would be completely and utterly lost. We would have no choice because we're all born in sin. We're all incredibly egotistical when we're born. 
Uh, just look at a two-year-old. They call it terrible twos for a reason. They begin to shine and show their true nature. And it's ultimately selfish. When a baby's hungry, doesn't wait for you to figure that out. They just scream. When they want something that's been taken away from them, they scream. When, they, when they're up in the middle of the night, you should be too. It's ultimately selfishness. And we learn how to finesse that and make it look more uh, slick when we practice it, like lying. We, we do lying in, in very, very quiet ways. I mean, we practice gossip sometimes in very quiet ways, like sharing a prayer request. You know, we should pray for this person here because they, let me tell you all about what's going on with them. And then it's gossip, but it's, but it's kind of covered with prayer. So all of those kind of things are what we get better and better at. But we're still sinners, whether it's in a simple form or a complicated form. And that's why Jesus came because we need a savior. Amen. I need to be saved my contaminated self. How about you? So Jesus puts up all of this. It says that he, he was in the world, that the world was made through him and the world did not know him, that he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And it's just that simple. It seems ridiculous, right? It's like, here, I'm giving you a check for $10 million. All you have to do is go deposit it. Oh, I don't believe you. <laughs> you know, that's what people do when they reject Jesus. They just don't deposit it. And it said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's about co-signing that check in faith. That's what we do as Christians. 740 years before Jesus came, Isaiah writes that he would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You know, he still does that today, if you give it to him. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Do you, do you wonder what a, a tremendous spiritual inheritance we have in Jesus Christ? And what a great privilege it is to share with those who don't, who don't know him yet and haven't had that adoption. So 740 years before Jesus came, at the very end, he could not speak because he was dehydrated and they see that he was trying to speak. And so he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why are you so far from me? The rest of the Psalm in Psalm 22 talks about how far he... He is from God. God was separated from God as Jesus bore the sins of the world. Can you imagine Jesus living all of his life with all of the power he had, and now he was powerless? He could not stop this. And he prays in the garden, Father, if this cup can pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. We see that Jesus was human and yet fully God and not able to help himself. That's, a, that's like watching your wife give birth. It's like, what are you going to do? I remember watching both my children be born and my grandchildren being born, and there is nothing you can do. Ice chips? What do you do? <laughs> you want me to hold your hand? No! Okay. And... You, you just you just hate to be there because you're wrong for being there. It was all your fault anyway. <laughs> and then you're wrong if you're not there. And then if you help, it's wrong. It's just everything's wrong. 
I just remember that incredibly helpless feeling. And I wonder, is, that's just a, a little drop of what Jesus experienced. And he's experienced more than all of us. And so Jesus waits. They put this hyssop into this wine vinegar and put it to his lips so that his lips can open from the dehydration. He's lost blood and he's drowning up on the cross as begins to fill the, the peritoneal cavity in his lungs. And they just want to hear him call on Elijah and see if Elijah comes because people are spectating uh, like they used to at the guillotine not so long ago in our history. When we would look back, people came for the show. It was like a circus. So they were waiting to see the show. And Jesus cries out, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus breathes his last and he says, It is finished. Because he was there to accomplish something. It wasn't a tragedy. It wasn't a failure. It was an accomplishment. And at the moment of his death, the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the most holy place split in two from the top to the bottom. It took an entire team of horses to haul this thing up into place. It was so thick and so heavy. And it ripped from top to bottom, showing that God has made a way for us to have acceptance before him. That veil was representative of his body, which was ripped and torn for us. That's what we just celebrated today with communion. His body was broken for us. His blood was spilled for us. And we identify with him again in the picture and the elements. There was an earthquake. The veil was split in two. And as the soldier, the Roman soldier who was head of the division, watched Jesus die, as the sky grew dark and he gave up his spirit, he said, surely this was the son of God. Even his enemies recognized his testimony was true. And the women were the ones that were there looking on from afar. And John, the, the youngest disciple, and Jesus, thinking of his mother, looks to John and says, behold your mother. And looks to his mother, Mary, and says, behold your son. And from that time forward, John took her into his home. Because his own brothers, Jesus' own half-brothers, didn't believe in him. And so he handed his mom over to somebody he knew was a believer and would care for his mom. I just uh, find that amazing that in the midst of his suffering, he thought about his mom and about those who would be left behind. It's a good idea to pre-plan. That's what Jesus did. And then Joseph of Arimathea, who's this undercover brother, knows who Jesus is and that he's the Messiah. And he, along with one other, Nicodemus, we saw Nick at night in the book of John where Jesus speaks to him at night up on the roof where he says, you must be born again. He's telling the premier teacher of Israel that he needs to be born again in which he doesn't understand and ask questions. Well, these two very wealthy, very well-off, very political Jews come out of the closet, so to speak, and they're now confessing believers in Jesus. He goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. Pilate was amazed that he was dead. He goes, really? I, 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 he died a little on the early side. Here's a guy who's a professional and know how long it takes to kill you on a cross. And they went and checked, and one of the Roman soldiers went and jammed a spear up under his ribcage into his heart and his lungs and pulled it out just to make sure. And out came water and blood, and he knew that he was dead. And then so they released the body to Joseph of Arimathea. He comes with Nicodemus, and they take the body of Jesus down, getting his blood all over themselves, getting filthy dirty, and yet wrapping him in, a, in a, a linen cloth and putting him in his own tomb, a hand-carved tomb, which means he was wealthy because you don't have things like that unless you're wealthy. He puts him in his own tomb and he lays him out. What they would typically do is wait for the body to degrade for a couple of years, and then they would collect the bones and put it in an ossuary, which is a box, a bone box, uh, 
You guys might have some of your loved ones in little urns. And so they put you on a shelf and then they put the next person in. And it's just this constant uh, economy of space. And so they put him in the tomb and they roll the stone across and they secure it. The Pharisees come to Pilate and say, listen, you'd better make sure that this stone, even though it weighs three and a half tons, make sure it's secure because he said while he was alive that he would rise on the third day. It's interesting. They knew, but his own disciples didn't get it. They said, you better secure that thing or you're going to have a martyr on your hands and you have a worse problem. And so he says, well, let's make it as secure as possible. And he takes a detachment of soldiers, like 40 soldiers, to guard a tomb. Now, if you're a soldier, that's the deal. That's what you want. I'm going to guard a tomb. And they seal it up with rope and wax, and they put an edict on it that if anyone disturbs it, it's under the penalty of death. And so they're guarding a tomb. Just a little extra insurance so that you would know that Jesus rose from the dead. This week, we're going to look at the resurrection. The resurrection is really everything, isn't it? Because if Christ is not risen from the dead, then neither will we. And it also means that all of your loved ones who have gone on before are gone forever. So the resurrection really is everything, isn't it? It's the linchpin of our faith. Beginning in chapter 16 of Mark, it says, Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? You see, when they put Jesus in the tomb, they did it so quickly because the sun was setting. And the Jews have this thing about the Sabbath. You got you to gotta get moving. And you got to be home by the time that happens because you're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath. And so they were hurrying to get him in there and get him wrapped. So there was some spices, there was some wrapping that was done, but it wasn't a complete job. They typically washed the body, which they didn't get a chance to do. And then they impact it with all of these spices and wrap it tightly. So they make mummies, essentially. Um, they do all of that, I imagine, so that you don't walk by tombs and smell what's going on inside. These women were approaching the tomb of Jesus Christ, not expecting a resurrection. You notice that? They went with spices and they said, when we get there, who's going to roll the stone away? We're going to finish treating his body, but because the Sabbath is over, all the holy days are over. Three, we've got three days. And so now the sun comes up and first thing, they want to make sure that Jesus is buried properly. They're not thinking about a resurrection. Isn't that amazing? That even his own followers didn't have faith that he was going to rise. And so... They kept asking each other, who's going to move the stone away? How are we going to get to him? Luckily, God has a plan. Amen. He sends an angel. And an angel rolls the stone back. And we don't have that in the book of Mark, but we do in Matthew. And an angel comes and sits on the stone and looks at the, the soldiers that are there. And they faint for fright. And they run away. Because... An angel shows up. So by the time they get there, everything's cleared out and the stone is rolled away. Not to let Jesus out, but to let the women in. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Well, Number one, we just buried somebody three days ago and the stone is rolled away and there's somebody sitting where he used to be. Yeah, that would freak me out a little bit. You know, you, you put somebody in a, you put their coffin in and you watch them get sealed up and you go back and it's open. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's the making of a movie. You know, the dawn of the dead. Except there's a young man. It's rather interesting. All of the sightings of angels are men, by the way. So you don't have any women angels, regardless of what Hallmark tells you. <laughs> and they all have male names. Michael, Gabriel, 
Lucifer. So there's a young man, and we find out from the other Gospels it was an angel. But he's clothed in white, which apparently that's what everybody's wearing in heaven. So I, I have to get a new wardrobe, but it'll be given to me. But he said to them, do not be alarmed, because they were alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Now, you remember, those ladies were the ones that saw him go in there. They were the ones who watched them roll the stone away and into the, over the opening. They were the ones who knew. There's no mistake here. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. You notice Peter has a whole category unto himself. You know why that is? Because the last time Jesus and he laid eyes on each other, he had just denied him three times. Run back and tell the disciples and Peter. Can you imagine hearing this and being Peter? Hey, the angel said that we should come back and tell you he's risen. And he said, especially you, Peter. <laughs> oh, Mufasa, you know. <laughs> See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee and that you will see him as he said to you. And so he went out quickly and fled from the tomb for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone as they were afraid. Now, in some of the oldest transcripts, that's the end of the book of Mark. It goes to verse 8, and we're left with, they were afraid and told no one. The end. Seems slightly abrupt. It certainly does. And I think because of that, there's this PS postscript, and you'll find it in the book of John as well. The 21st chapter of John feels very much like a, oh, by the way, one other thing. And that's what happens here. Now I could get into the Sinaiticus and I can get into the, all of the, the background, but just know this, the oldest, most reliable manuscript that we have has a section where Mark should be, the rest of Mark should be written, but it's not. It's cordoned off as though somebody intended on copying it, but they didn't. So if you look in your Bible and after verse eight, it says most, uh, the manuscripts don't carry this. The most reliable manuscripts or the oldest manuscripts do not have the rest of the book. Understand that the rest of the oldest, most reliable manuscript has about 300 omissions because it's a copy. It was done in the, it was done in the 400s. And so you're not going to have every little thing that was written down. We have thousands of texts who were written around that time and they kind of fill in the blanks and we've taken everything and put it together. And so you have the 66 books that you have. So I can tell you what you have on your lap or what you have on your phone or what you read on a daily basis, it's reliable and you can trust it. But they will put that little bit of question. I just don't want you to question these things because as we look at it, you're going to see it's kind of a, oh, P.S. By the way, postscript, this is, this is what happened afterwards. So that's it. Thank you very much for coming. No, we're going to move on to the rest up to verse 20. Now look how the timeline backs up slightly. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. By the way, we don't have that information anywhere else. She had seven demons. Now most people believe that she was a woman of ill repute, that she was a prostitute. And yet, I don't know what happens when you have seven demons, do you? I hope you don't. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, 
they did not believe. So you have the women going to the tomb who didn't believe he was going to be resurrected. They were wondering who's going to move aside the stone so they can continue wrapping his body. You have his disciples who, by the way, there are women who come ahead of her when they leave and they say, listen, we've, we went to the tomb. He's alive. He's risen from the dead. An angel told us. And the men were like, yeah, you guys are off your rocker. Mary Magdalene stays around a little while and she weeps at the tomb. When she does that, a person walks up. She presumes it to be the gardener. Maybe he had boots on, overalls, don't know. Something he picked up off of a, uh, a clothesline because Jesus was naked. <coughs> and says, <coughs> woman, why are you crying? And she says, because they've taken my Lord and I don't know where they've taken him. She doesn't believe in a resurrection. She thinks they've stolen his body away. And in the middle of her tears, she looks at the gardener and says, if you have taken his body somewhere, just tell me where it is and I will take it. Really? You're going to take a dead naked body, throw it over your shoulder and then put it in the tomb and wrap it up. And uh, Really? Do you see how she has absolutely no idea that he's risen? None. The disciples, when the women come back, they count them as being hysterical. And they don't believe. Now, if you were going to write the Bible and write it like a novel, you would not put this in. Because there's nobody who's a hero in this story except for Jesus. Nobody believes. They did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. Now, you guys know this as the road to Emmaus. There are two disciples that are walking along and they're leaving. And there's somebody who's kind of pulling up behind them. They wonder if they're being stalked. And they keep walking along. And this person comes up, maybe with a hoodie on. But it says that he appeared in another form. Isn't that interesting? The wording of that? Because they didn't recognize him. In fact, all of the post appearings of Jesus Christ, they were all amazed at his, the way he looked. John 21, same thing. They didn't recognize him. Something weird, something different. Maybe it was the missing beard chunks. Maybe it was because he was beaten. Maybe it's because he had a resurrected body. Don't know, but they had trouble recognizing him in every one of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, and they all involve food. Just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> he appeared in another form as they walked into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe it either. So you're the disciples. You're all walled up in a locked room, locked windows, locked doors, and suddenly there's a boop, 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 boop. And there's an hysterical couple of women coming in saying that Jesus is alive because an angel told them. Right. Then Mary Magdalene comes in and says she saw Jesus. In fact, she gripped them. He said, well, woman, you got to let go of me. It's pretty much what he said in Jersey form. You can't hold on to me. I've, I've got to go to my father. So go back and tell the disciples. And so she does. And they don't believe. Now there's two other disciples who just had a long conversation with him on the road to Emmaus. They sat down to eat and they, they suddenly recognized him as he broke bread. I wonder if it was the piercings in his hands. I wonder if it was the way he said, you know, blessed are you, Lord God. I, I don't know what it was. But they suddenly, their eyes were opened and they realized it was Jesus and poof, he disappeared. So they have seen the risen Lord. And they run back in the middle of the night. Now it's dark. Sun is down. And they run 12 miles back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. And the disciples say, yeah, I don't think so. Had a pair of women. Had Mary Magdalene. Had another couple of disciples come. And still the disciples are not buying it. Now, Jesus said it multiple times. As we went through Mark, I pointed it out. He said, 
I'm about to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they're going to hand me to the Romans, and I'm going to, I'm going to be killed. They're like, oh. And they didn't get it. Later, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Jesus held them to account to believe all of the testimony they heard. And you know, it's kind of a little snapshot of what's going to happen in heaven. Because none of us is without, is, is, has an excuse, right? We've all heard. We've heard about Jesus Christ. Probably one of the most common names in the entire world. And I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll go back to the videotape. I'm sure it'll be Warner Wolf will be there and He'll go to the videotape and say, well, why didn't you listen when I spoke to you here and here and here and here and here and here and here? You remember Jesus shows up, locked doors, locked windows, and he says, peace be with you. And they all go, <gasps> listen, I warned you, I sent you a whole bunch of visitors to let you know I'm coming. <laughs> and they were still shocked. And he looked around, and he goes, you got anything to eat? And they, <laughs> they gave him some fish and he sat down and ate some fish in their very presence. He says, it's me. I'm not a ghost. Does a ghost have flesh and bone as I have? Notice he doesn't say sh flesh and blood. He says flesh and bone as I have. There was one who was not with them. His name was Thomas. Thomas was out, you know, getting a happy meal or something. And after Jesus left, Thomas comes back in the room, and now all the disciples are on the train of resurrection. And they're like, he was here. And he's like, I will not believe unless I can stick my finger in the holes in his hands and thrust my arm into the hole in his side. And from then on, he got the nickname Doubting Thomas, which is actually a... a a nicety, because he was unbelieving Thomas, right? So Jesus shows himself to the disciples, and of course, Thomas gets a chance to make good, but instead of poking into his side and sticking his finger into his holes in his hands, he drops to his knees and he says, my Lord and my God. He calls him Adonai and Elohim. These are terms for God. And he wasn't like, OMG. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It was my Lord and my God. And he's on his knees before Jesus. And if, if that was wrong, Jesus would have corrected him, but he didn't. Yeah. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He means human beings, men, women, and children. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I want you to notice he says, believe and be baptized. There's a, there's a recent legalistic wave going throughout the church that says, if you don't get baptized, you're not saved. That baptism saves you. And if you look at this scripture, you might say the very same thing. Well, baptism, I guess, saves you. Because it says, believe and be baptized. But what do you have to do to not be saved? Just not believe. It doesn't say not be baptized. And if it was equal, it would be there, wouldn't it? But it's not there. So... Believe and be baptized. It's like uh, I, I heard John Piper say, it's like, you know, you better, if you're going to catch that train, you better run because you're going to be late. Oh, by the way, make sure you grab your hat. Grabbing your hat doesn't make you not late. It's the running, and, it's the running that does it. But don't forget the hat. It's a pretty good analogy. I like that. Believe and be baptized. Baptism is what they did to publicly proclaim. And actually, the Lord's Supper comes a little bit later as a practice in the church where they would come together. And they did it not once a month. They did it once a year. It was called Passover. We do it once a month because we don't do the whole deal. You know, we just do that deal. So 
He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Matthew 28, we get the longer version of what Jesus said. To the 11 disciples, as they went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed to them, and when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Can you believe that after this, they still doubt? They've seen Jesus. He's shown up more than once. He showed up twice. And everybody said, hey, yeah, we saw him too. He was actually seen by Peter. He made a special visit with Peter. It's interesting we don't have the details of that other than it's just stated in 1 Corinthians. They doubted. I, I feel a whole lot better about being a Christian today. You guys ever have doubts? Not you good people. They did. Even after they saw his resurrected body, even after he spoke with them, even after he reassured them, all of these things that he did, they still doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That is significant. Because who's the little G of this world, the little God of this world? The devil is. Except he's the big G of this world. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, or check it out, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So if you're feeling overwhelmed with what Jesus is saying, just remember all power and authority has been given unto him and he gives it to us. Amen. And we're to take it out. He says this, Make disciples, first thing. Go, therefore, and make disciples. We see in our passage in Mark, he says to go and preach the gospel. You preach the gospel to make disciples. By the way, it doesn't ever say anywhere to make converts. Hey, you believe in Jesus? Yeah, pray, pray this prayer, prayer with me and you're saved. Here's a Bible. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. No. Make disciples. A disciple is something that's a much harder thing to make than a convert. Because God does the work in somebody's heart for them to be open. Making a disciple means, hey, look at your life. Look what the Bible says. Ooh, something's wrong here. It's not the Bible. That's called discipleship. That means like the disciples who spent three and a half years with Jesus and learned by watching, that's what a disciple does. I hope you're all discipling at least one person. I hope there's one person that has their eye on you and says, I want to be more like Jesus, so I want to be more like you. That's scary. And that's why a lot of people don't want to do it. But Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Make disciples. That's a very willful word, isn't it? Make disciples. It's an intentional word. Make disciples. You can't do it without God's power, but make disciples baptizing them. Baptism is part of a natural confession publicly about what God has already done. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Wow, the Trinity is right in there. Slipped it in. Jesus just slipped that in there. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. That's part of what it is to make a disciple, by the way, is teaching them everything that Jesus has said so that they obey, right? Right? That's what a disciple is. Somebody that knows what Jesus said and does it. Make sense? Yeah. It just seems simple to me. But Matthew has the extended version. Mark always has just the facts. He just puts down the bare necessities. And now I have that song in my head. And these signs will follow those who believe. Okay, fasten your seatbelts. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So, how can you tell if somebody knows Jesus Christ? 
There it is. How you guys doing on your little checklist? <laughs> you laying hands on people and healing them, are you? Are you picking up snakes? Come on, be honest. Are you drinking poisonous things from McDonald's and they don't hurt you? <laughs> Are you casting out demons? Now remember, I'm, I'm viewing from verse 9 on as a postscript. And so this is looking back at some of those things that had happened. Now, if you know the, the book of Acts, it talks about how the disciples went and they were casting out demons and laying their hands. And people were taking Peter's handkerchief and running out to people because Peter was too busy healing people. They brought the handkerchief, said, this is Peter's handkerchief, and it was a point of faith, and they said, I believe, and put their faith in Christ, and they were holding on to a, uh, this handkerchief, which God knows what was in it, and they were getting saved. They were getting healed. It's an amazing time. All of these things happened in the first century, and you can read it in the book of Acts. Handling snakes. We see Paul. Paul is on his way to stand in Rome and give an account for his faith. And they have a shipwreck. The ship wrecks. Everybody you know, swims to shore, some on boards. It's the first account of surfboards in the Bible. And they all get to the shore, and it's nighttime, and so they want to build a fire. So Paul, who's a prisoner, goes around and gathers some sticks to make a fire. Here's Paul serving a whole bunch of criminals on this boat including the Romans. And in the middle of picking up some sticks, a viper, by the way, they're poisonous, came out and bit him in the hand. And he, because he was not an environmentalist, shook it off into the fire. And he kept going about his business. Now, the people of that area said, oh, God's mad at you. That's why you had a shipwreck. And he tried to kill you, but you survived. But he got you with the viper, didn't he? And so they stood around and they watched, probably made popcorn. <laughs> yeah, he's going he's gonna to swell up like crazy. You just watch. No, he's not swelling up. And then they figured he's a god. They went from thinking that he was God's worst enemy to that he must be a god. Which was good because he was able to share the gospel with them. So you never know what God's going to use. Amen. And so, yeah. There was a viper that bit him, and he shook it off. People at Peter would probably be angry at him. Second chapter of Acts, we see tongues of fire coming on people's heads as the Holy Spirit comes down. We see it later on. It happens in Cornelius' household, and they all began to speak in tongues, even as the Jews did. All of these things is kind of like a condensed version of what happened in the book of Acts. So you see, that's why it's probably a postscript here on, on uh, Mark's behalf. So those are the signs of those who would believe. Maybe not you. Now, there are some people that pick up rattlesnakes and they drink strychnine. There are churches in the Appalachians who do that. And they say, see what great faith we have? Look, we're doing those signs. We must be real believers. Although some of them die. It's true. In fact, there was a lawsuit against the pastor of one of these churches because they lost a few. Guys, we're not going to be picking up snakes in here, okay? <laughs> Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. When Satan was tempting him in the wilderness and said, hey, took him up to the took him up to the highest part of the temple and said, here, listen, jump off, Jesus, because the Bible says that he will give his angels concerning you that you won't even strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, do not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, you don't do stupid things to say, watch how much faith I have. God, save me. If you're really there, God, send lightning right now. You know, don't do stuff like that because you might be a recipient. So then... After the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying, I will even add the aforementioned signs. And so all the disciples went out and they exhibited all these things as a confirmation that what they said was true and it was of God, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. 
and it confirms the message. So that's the end of the book of Mark. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up if they would. Next week, we're going to leave a little mystery in your life.